You know, every time we fly, we go overseas. Something which never, never ceases to amaze me is the announcement which the flight attendant does. You know what they say to you? They say, in the unlikely event of an accident, oxygen masks will fall from above you. And then they say to you, please affix or fixate the mask on yourself before attending to others. And I thought about that statement. I thought, subhanAllah, why do we have to put the mask on ourselves before attending to others? So if my child who is four years old or seven years old is next to me, I have to put the mask on myself? That sounds pretty selfish, doesn't it? But then I thought about it. If you can't breathe and you only have about a minute or less, how are you supposed to help the others breathe? How will you help your children breathe? How will you help other people who are gasping for air, especially the children who are not able to place the mask on themselves? So I thought, subhanAllah, the ayah which in the, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu. O oh, you who believe. It's amazing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is addressing those who believe. He's not addressing those who don't believe. As though the ones who believe are the ones who can help others who don't believe. You need to breathe first though. O oh, you who believe. Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu. O oh, you who believe. <coughs> Save yourself. He didn't say, save your family, save your neighbor, save your friend, save the world. He didn't say that. He said, save yourself, save the animals. No. Save yourself in the first degree. Then Allah said, and then your family from hellfire. And then your family from hellfire. In the Arabic language, when you put a statement like this, then you look at the context. Whatever is mentioned first is considered to be in priority to what comes later. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, save yourself and your family means save yourself first. And after you've looked after yourself, then comes next in line your family. Because you are responsible for your family, you're responsible for your wife, you're responsible for your children. The wife is responsible also for her duty towards her husband and then towards her children. You'll be responsible for them. Because your children and your family is part of your work. But if you are not right, then your family is not going to be right. And you will be questioned on the day of judgment about yourself and then in the second degree about your family. And one verse in the Quran, which Wallahi sends also shivers down our spine, is the, is the one in Surah Abasa wa Tawalla where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala finally said, on the day of judgment, each person will run away from their own brother. Why brother? Why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say brother first? Because it is considered that the brother is the main support when you say in Arabic, your brother, we consider the brother to be, to be the support. So on the day of judgment, there is no support from your brother and from their mother and their father, because they're the providers. There's no provider for you on the day of judgment and their friend or their spouse and their children, especially the sons, because the sons are also considered to be a support. There is no support for you. Each person on that day will have a matter, an affair, which they have to be dealing with. And they're too busy for anyone else. Brothers and sisters in Islam, if yourself is not right, then everything else is not right. And then if your family is not right, you see, your children will be running away from you. Your spouse will be running away from you. Your friends, your brothers, all of them will disperse. You know why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to ask you about your responsibilities. Your own children, you don't want to see them on the day of judgment. Your spouse, you don't want to see her or him on the day of judgment. Because after questioning you and your actions, Allah will question you about your family. So what do you do? You run away from them. SubhanAllah. In this world, we run away to them. On the day of judgment, we run away from them. So my brothers and sisters in Islam, our number one priority is ourself. And secondly, our family. Now there's something which we neglect in fact, the majority of people neglect. You know, to survive in happiness, everybody is after happiness, aren't they? We look into the world today and we find there is this article which I read, a study which I read a few months ago, which appeared in the uh, American Journal of Psychiatry. And what it said is an interesting study. The American Journal of Psychiatry. It said that the highest rate of suicide Stay with me. The highest rate of suicide exists in people who do not attach themselves to religion. 
They don't believe in God. So the highest rate of suicide are either atheists or agnostics or people who are not really attached to the religion. We're talking even about uh, you know, Christians, uh, Hindus, Muslims, but they're not really attached to their religion. As though they are atheists or agnostic. And the lowest rates of suicide actually exist in people who do believe in God and people who are attached to their religion. Subhanallah. <laughs> because there is hope. When a person attach them, attaches themselves to Allah, to God, to their creator, to their religion, they know that this life has a purpose beyond just the materialistic world. So people who don't actually believe in Allah, they have nothing else to live for. So what do they live for? Let me ask you a question. If a non-Muslim came up to any one of us Muslims right now and asked us the question, why are you a Muslim? Why are you a Muslim? The common answer would be something like this. And I've asked this question to many of my students. Why are you a Muslim? <coughs> they will say, I don't know, because I was born a Muslim. Well, what does that mean? You were born a Muslim. Uh, common answers are, well, because I'm raised in a Muslim family. Is that really why you're Muslim? Because you were raised in a Muslim family? Well, then if that's the case, any person can be on the right track then. Because a Christian will say, I was raised a Christian. I was raised an Anglican. I was raised a Catholic. A Jew can say, you know, well, well Jews then will be in the highest degree. Because in their faith, if, if you don't have the bloodline of a Jew, then really, you know, you're not really superior. So then we can say that the Jews really are superior. If it just comes to the matter of being raised upon a religion that your family is on or being born into the bloodline of a particular religious family, if that's what it takes, then everybody's going to heaven. Nobody's going to hellfire. Everybody's on the right track. It's not your fault. I was raised a Muslim. I was born into a Muslim family. I was raised in a Muslim country. Because you know what the problem is there? We find that a person who doesn't know why they're Muslim, they will look for happiness somewhere else because they actually don't know their identity. You know, I've seen in many instances young people, they rebel against their own parents. You know why? They move away from the deen. And I've seen two types of people. This is something interesting fact. I don't know if you've observed it before, but back in Australia we observed this. I've noticed that some young people, when they belong to a Muslim family, a religious family, but don't exactly know why they are Muslim, as soon as their relationship with their family goes wrong, like a dysfunctional family, you'll find that they actually detach themselves from Islam. And they start to resort to going with gangs, and groups of people who have a particular identity that is far away from Islam. They wear certain jackets. They put on certain, sometimes tattoos of certain sorts. They resort to things like drugs. They go to places where they can be identified and have a name. Some of them resort to even, and I'm going to say this word, extremist views. Not because they want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be pleased with them, but because they want to be known. They want to have an identity, a place in this world. So they rebel against their own family because they never knew why they were actually Muslims. And I put some of this responsibility on the parents themselves. When you teach your children, teach them number one, why they are Muslim. When your child asks you the question, who am I and why am I Muslim? Why do I have to pray? It's not enough just to say them, well, you're, you have to pray because you're a Muslim. And then we punish them for not praying, but we don't reward them for when they do good acts. Brothers and sisters, you know, there is this saying, we complain that our children don't obey us, but they never fail to imitate us. They imitate you. So when you are angry at your son or daughter for not praying, what they learn from you is not prayer, they learn from you anger. They learn from you that religion is by force. When this sister, when the girl grows up to wear her hijab and she doesn't understand why she's wearing her hijab and they find that the community forces it upon her or because she has to fit to the norms of the society without us explaining to them 
what the meaning of hijab is, what the meaning of khimar is. We don't explain to them that it has a, a huge history in the civilization of humanity since the beginning of time. Then all they think of is, well, you know, I have to wear it because of cultural reasons. And time and time again, I find young people, especially living in the West, and I don't think here in the Emirates we are safe from that because although Emirates is a beautiful, wonderful Muslim country and we have so many Muslim families and communities, Alhamdulillah, you know, I, I get jealous that my children can't be raised in a society like this. I would have loved that, subhanAllah. I mean, well, just, just to sort of go off topic a little bit, I visited Dubai last year and my daughter, who was eight years old at the time, I asked her, I went to Umrah that time and I said to her, what would you like as a gift? What do you want as a present? And she was with her mother here in Dubai visiting. She said, I want a abaya. Can you get me a abaya? Now to you, this is probably very normal. You know, it's abaya is abaya, right? Every woman wears a abaya. Every girl wears a abaya. It's very normal. But for me, this was the best gift. Because you see, back in Australia in the West, no one wears a abaya. They do wear a abaya, but that's the last thing on their mind. They see their friends wearing shorts. They see their friends, you know, wearing clips in their hair and doing their fashionable hair. When she said to me, I want a abaya, it's because she's affected by the community that's around her. Now that's really good and excellent. But when she went back, she's affected by the other community. So I had to plant a seed inside of her. Why, what, what's hijab? Who wears hijab? What is hijab for? What does it mean? And in my son, what does prayer mean? And so on and so forth. If they don't understand that, then they're going to detach themselves. I've seen it time and time again. As soon as they reach, they become teenagers. They rebel against their family, their own parents. They can't wait to be free, as they say. And so they have two identities. One outside the home and one inside the home. In the olden days, when they told us, if we did something wrong and our parents said to us, go to your room, it was a punishment. What am I going to do in the room among four walls? Today, when you tell your children, go to your room, it's like paradise for them. <laughs> Just give them the iPad, give them their phone. Forget about the computers, they don't even want computers anymore. Or TVs. Just give them their iPad and their phone. And it's as if they are living in Las Vegas, in Los Angeles, in the heart of New York. They can go, they can go to the Bahamas. They can go to Hawaii. They can go to the darkest, deepest places of the world which you cannot imagine. And the parents, they don't understand what's actually happening through social media. Brothers and sisters in Islam, it is so important and vital in this time more than any other time to plant the seed of understanding of our religion. If you don't know how to, then seek advice from other people who have experience in educating young people. Otherwise, they will rebel. I've also seen the opposite happen. Stay with me. I've seen children who rebel from their parents when they're religious because they felt that they were forced into the religion. And there's also the opposite that, that happens. I've seen non-religious children in non-religious families go the other way. They become religious. But not because they found light in Islam, but only because they didn't like their parents' ways anymore. So they rebel. They rebel. These people don't find happiness. Rebelling means to go against a norm, to go against something that you don't like. So you go in the opposite direction. We see it between couples. When people get married and their intention is not sincere to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, their priorities are mixed up. And I was having a chat before with one of my brothers. And in Australia, I do marriages. I solemnize marriages a lot. And this is what we see all the time. When a boy and a girl get married, a young man and woman, you find that they love each other a lot. Well, at least in the beginning. But as time goes on, six months later, they get used to their marriage and all the faults and the uh, habits, they start to come out and it becomes ordinary. You find that a girl, for example, a wife becomes religious because she loves her husband. Or a man who wants to marry this religious girl, you find that he starts going to the masjid because her father likes a religious man for his daughter. So suddenly you find him in the masjid a lot, appearing as if he's religious. They become married. And if something goes wrong in their marriage, they rebel. So for example, if the wife loved her husband and he was religious and then he disappointed her, 
they separate and you find her hijab starts to decrease. You find that she starts going towards things that don't remind her about her husband. And if religion reminds her about her husband, then she doesn't do religion anymore. If the man who married a woman was because of her religion, and then his love for her decreases, unfortunately you also find that his love for his religion also decreases. What am I saying? I'm saying that if the heart is not right, then it doesn't matter what you do with your actions. They will never be accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is called riya. One of the worst diseases that exist among the Muslims themselves. And one of the greatest promises that the shaitan made to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that he said, لَأَقْعُدَنَّ لَهُمْ صِرَاطَكَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ I will sit awaiting for them on your straight path. Meaning I'm going to look for their salat, I'm going to look for their fasting, their charity, and I'm going to be waiting, whispering in their ear, telling them, do that action just to please people. Or oh, look at that person, he looked at you giving charity. Look at that person, he, he or she looked at you making your salat in the masjid. Look at that person, he looked at you wearing a hijab. Increase it, make it better to impress them. You will not receive the reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if it's done for other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And truly, you find that if your intention wasn't right from the beginning, as time goes on, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings a hardship upon you, you find yourself actually reversing very easily. And this is the meaning of the verse where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in Surah Al-Hajj, and among people are those who worship Allah on the edge, like the edge of a cliff. When good happens to them, they stay put, they're content. But when they are afflicted with some kind of trial or a hardship, they fall down, forward, flat on their face. They have lost this world and their hereafter. Time and time again, we see people who look religious on the outside, but unfortunately their goal is materialism. Wealth, their car, their homes, their houses, their dwellings, their work to be promoted in their career, a wife or a husband, maybe. Their goal is popularity, for example. Their goal is fame. Their goal is to have a good time in life, having a good time materialism, after materialism. And when we watch the celebrities in the world who look happy on the outside, but miserable on the inside, we find that suicidal rates are so high with them. Drug addictions are so high with them. We all know this. Why? Because when you are after something that is temporary, then your happiness is also temporary. So why do they go on drugs and alcohol? In order to forget. To forget the misery and unhappiness that exists in the world. Divorce rates are so high among the celebrities. Why? Because they're after just their desires and enjoyment. When you get used to something after it was new and it becomes old and yellow, right? You want something new again. And when you keep getting something new and you get bored of it, and you keep getting something new and you get bored of it, you run out of new things. So then you resort to intoxications, only to forget that you live in this world. But when your goal is something which is eternal, and Jannah is eternal, then the goal never runs out. Why do you think people become unhappy? Why do you think people commit suicide, as we said? Because whatever they are after has run out. So be careful, my brothers and sisters. And the only person who can answer this question is you. Sit down by yourself and question yourself. What is really your goal? And I'm going to give you some signs about how to know what pathway you are on. Number one, do you judge yourself before others? Now here's a really good one. You ready to hear it? There's something we call the comfort zone. You know what a comfort zone is? It's where you yourself feel comfortable. You feel comfortable to do the things that you want to do. And usually it's in places where nobody can watch you. Nobody can see you. If you're married, 
You hide away from your wife, for example. She can't see what you're doing. Or your husband. You hide away from your children. If you're a child, you hide away from your parents, for example. You hide away from religious people, maybe, if that's not what you want. Right? In your comfort zone. Comfort zone can also mean you are around the people who want the same thing you want. In your comfort zone, in your private comfort zone, what kind of a person are you? What are the things that you normally do? What are the things that you listen to? What are the things that you like looking at? I know some young people, maybe even older people, you put them in their comfort private zone and you give them a screen to look at and the internet and it makes you sick if you were to see what they are looking at, who they are talking to, what kind of activities they're doing. As an educator, a teacher, and a student counselor as well, young people at the age of 14, 15, and 16, even 17, boys and girls, how often they approach me talking about their secret affairs, what they do in private, but they are too afraid to talk to their parents about. That's who they really are. Who you really are is what you do in secret. Because you know the hadith of the Prophet wasallam, when he was talking to his companions and he said about the majority of his ummah, the Muslims, the majority of the members of his ummah will end up in hellfire not because of common sins that everyone else does, not because of major sins such as alcohol and zina. But he said, when they were alone in secret in their comfort zone, when they are alone in private with the things which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has forbidden, they penetrate the forbidden boundaries. They look at things which they don't, they're not supposed to look at. They begin to talk and say things which they are not supposed to. They chat with people whom they don't even know who they're chatting with across the world behind usernames about things which serve their desires. They listen to things which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has forbidden them to listen to because that's what they desire. And the majority of people from the ummah of Rasulullah will enter hellfire because of what they do in private which no one else knows. You know why? It's not because of doing that sin. Some of them are minor sins. In fact, the majority of them are minor sins. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not put the people from the ummah of Rasulullah in the fire because of merely just the sins. But you see, when you are alone in your comfort zone, that's who you really are. It's who you really are. And that's the reason why members of the ummah of Rasulullah may end up being tortured or punishment, punished, not because of the actual acts which they are doing, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is forgiving, is merciful. But it's because that's what defines who you really are in your identity. That's who you really are. Now let's look at the opposite effect. There are people who you see them smiling in front of you. They're in the masjid, they're cheerful. And you think, subhanAllah, they've got no problems at all. But when they are alone between them and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they make wudu. They pray two rak'ahs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They stand long in their salat. And their smile turns into tears. They're crying. When they're alone with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These are the mu'mineen whose true identity is really the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They cannot wait to get home. After their long day, their spouse goes to sleep. Their children go to sleep and they want their own private time to do what? Just to connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to cry to Him, to complain to Him, to talk to Him subhanahu wa ta'ala. The sign of a person whose true identity is the, and their priority is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you will find that whether they are in need or not in need, when they are in trouble or not in trouble, they just love to talk to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. They make dua when they are in need and they make dua when they are not in need. 
Because a lot of us have forgotten that dua is not just about when you need something from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You should not be a person who only turns to Allah when they need something or when they are in strife, when they are in hardships. A mu'min makes no difference. Whose priority is Allah. They turn to Allah when they're happy and when they're sad, when they're in need and when they're not. You know why? Because they truly love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Hands up if you've ever fallen in love with someone. <laughs> now I think every person who's married here should have their hand up. You should be in love with your wife or your husband. Right there you go. <laughs> we have one brother here. I was hoping for everybody to put their hand up. Except for the young ones who are not married yet. So everyone who's married, put your hand up. Have you fallen in love with someone? Yes, good, that's the way you fall in love. <laughs> now some of our men here are thinking, oh, I'm a gentleman. You know, I don't put my hand up to show my wife I love her. This is something which uh, I'd like to reserve alone. <laughs> But Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was asked one time, Who do you love the most? Who do you love the most? And what did he say? Aisha radiallahu anha. Was he ashamed to say to his sahabas, I love Aisha the most? <laughs> and he had the strength of 30 men, right? Thumma man, he said Abuha, her father, Abu Bakr radiallahu anha, and so on and so forth. Now honestly, the person he loved the most was really Khadija radiallahu anha. But in the lifetime of those who survived, in his time when he was asked that question, he said, Aisha, there's no problem in a man saying, I love my wife. You should love your, your wife. And the wife should love her husband. Now, those of you who said that you love your wife and those of you who said you love your husband, I'm presuming that you've been married for a few years now. Okay, we're talking to the people who've been married, you know, 10 years and above. I'm sure your love has become very ordinary and you become used to it, right? So let's take, back, take you back about 10 years ago when you first met your spouse. How was your love then? You know, when you were engaged? What did you do? Your beloved was always on your mind, right? When you go to sleep, you dream about them. <laughs> when you wake up, the first one you mention is them. After saying, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa anna Muhammad rasulullah. Habbika habibti. Ah, oh, Fulan, Muhammad, you're on my mind. That becomes your daily dhikr almost. So when you love that person so much, they're always on your mind. You want to call them, you want to speak to them. When you're at school, you're doing your exam, right? And you can't help but suddenly write your beloved's name accidentally. You think, what am I doing, right? You see them everywhere you go. You don't really need them. But because you feel an attachment to them, a love, you find yourself wanting to talk to them. You find yourself remembering them. So you start making dhikr. <laughs> but your dhikr is the loved one. On a different note, imagine you've gone overseas. Who do you start remembering? You remember the loved ones. When you're in pain, who do you remember? You remember your loved ones. The more you are distant from your loved ones, the more you remember them. Not because you need them, but because you love them. Allah should be the most beloved to you more than anyone else. And if you love anyone more than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, listen carefully, if you love anyone more than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then I would say that you are at risk of one day becoming harmful to yourself. You may be at risk of one day becoming suicidal. And I'm not joking. Why? Because anything or anyone you love more than Allah will one day leave you. You don't own your spouse. You don't own your children. You don't own your wealth. You don't even own yourself. My evidence? When you were born, you were born crying. You didn't want to come out into this world. You said, take me back inside. But you had to come out because you don't own yourself. You don't control yourself. And when you come to die, you can't give yourself another minute to live. Why? Because you don't own yourself. If a sickness befalls you, you can't take it away from you because you don't own yourself. You can prevent death from the people you love, but you can't. 
because you don't own them. You don't own anything. You and I don't own anything, not even ourselves. We all belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. From Him we came and to Him we shall return. So if your love is for something that is temporary, then remember what Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu said at the time of the death of our beloved Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What happened? Umar radiallahu anhu stood up and he held his sword saying, anyone who says that Rasulullah has died, I will strike his neck. I don't believe that he died. Ali radiallahu anhu, he became dumbfounded, he couldn't talk anymore. Another sahabi, he fell to the ground, couldn't walk anymore. Another one said, if it's true, then oh Allah, make me blind so I may not see anyone but Rasulullah after this. Another one said, oh Allah, if it's true, take my life because I don't want to live another minute. After that, it tr they truly loved Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But what did Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu say? He turned around and said to the people, Man kana ya'budu Muhammadan fa inna Muhammadan qad mat. Whoever used to worship Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, then Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has died. He's gone. وَمَنْ كَانَ يَعْبُدُ اللَّهَ فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ حَيٌّ لَا يَمُوتُ But whoever loves Allah and worshipped Allah, then Allah is everlasting. He will never die. Imagine if Abu Bakr did not come out and remind the people that your love is first and foremost to Allah, which explains why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not leave His prophets to live forever. Because people will probably end up worshipping them instead of Allah. Their love for them would, su would supersede Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's love. Knowing that they will leave us. Forgetting that they came from Allah. That these prophets, you will not love them. If it wasn't for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's love. Turning back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the lesson. Because Allah is everlasting and He will never die. And we remember Ibrahim alayhi salam. When he looked up into the sky and he saw the stars. He said... You know, everyone chose a star to worship and he saw the moon. He said, this is my God. But when day came, the moon went and he said, no, 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 no. My Lord doesn't leave me. I don't like those who leave me. Then he saw the sun. Then he said, oh, the sun, this is bigger and brighter. This is my God. But when night came, the sun went away. And Ibrahim salam said, what? My God, Allah leaves me? No, no, no. I don't want a God that leaves me. Obviously, he's teaching the people something that if you worship Allah, if you worship materialistic things, they're going to leave you. Nothing lasts. Then he said, Allah is forever. He never leaves me. Allah is with me wherever I go. And when you die, you return back to him. So our ultimate love is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because when that thing leaves you, then you will become suicidal. I remember back in, uh, you call it elementary school here. We call it high school. Is that right, Fadi? It's elementary. Elementary is the high school or secondary schooling. I remember when I was in form two or year eight of my schooling, we used to walk to school and there was this bridge that we crossed. It was above a, a river. One day we're walking to school in back in Australia and there was a dead body, a dead body in the river. This man had jumped off the bridge and killed himself. The ambulances came and you know, as children, we ask a lot of questions. How did he die? What did he die for? You know, what happened? He had left a note. Obviously, as a non-Muslim, that didn't know what his purpose was. The note said that his long-time girlfriend left him for another man. So he had no reason to live anymore. So he killed himself. He couldn't bear the pain. Subhanallah. Subhanallah. He worshipped his girlfriend. And his whole life was for his girlfriend. So when his girlfriend left him, he took his life. You remember that actor? What's his name? Robin Williams? Remember Robin Williams? Anyone heard of Robin Williams, that comedian? Yes? Robin Williams? Famous actor from America. Very famous actor. He committed suicide about two years ago or less. He has all the wealth of the world. You always see him cheerful, laughing, joking. But he went from divorce to divorce. I mean, finally he hanged himself and killed himself. No reason to live. Why? Because obviously the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was not there. The purpose, which is Allah, was not there.
So my brothers and sisters in Islam, what kind of a person are you in your comfort zone? And what is your true goal? How is your prayer? Does your life revolve around your prayer? Or does your prayer revolve around your busy life? For example, if you're a businessman or you run a shop or something like that at work, and the time for Adhan comes along, it's Dhuhr prayer or Asr prayer. Have you tried to work out a way so that you can move away and do your Salat and then return back to your work? Or have you struggled with that all your life? but manage to get your work right. And I can't go on without mentioning that little poster which keeps coming into my brain. I once saw this poster entering the masjid one time. This poster had a picture of a young boy, probably about 18 years old. And in that picture, it shows him asleep in bed and his parents are waking him up for salat. Al-Fajr. And he's so annoyed saying, Fear Allah, man, fear Allah, let me go to sleep. I've got to give myself sleep, you know, I've got work. But it's time for Fajr. And then about nine o'clock, he missed the alarm clock. And he's got him in the other picture saying to his parents, Fear Allah, fear Allah, why didn't you wake me up on time? Now I'm going to be late for work. But he didn't ask them to fear Allah not waking up for Fajr. Now, obviously, it's just a cartoon figure. But then I wondered how many of us are in that situation? How many of us feel so annoyed when we are woke enough for Fajr? But we, we, we don't feel annoyed when we are woken up for our work. We probably get up very tired. We probably stayed up watching uh, the soccer game last night. But when it comes to work, we will not miss it ever. Subhanallah. Go to the cemetery, to the graveyard. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi did tell us, أَلَا إِنِّي قَدْ نَهَيْتُكُمْ عَنْ زِيَارَةِ الْقُبُورِ أَلَا فَزُرُوهَا فَإِنَّهَا تُذَكِّرُكُمْ بِالْآخِرَةِ Behold everyone, before I forbid you from visiting the graves, now I order you to visit the graves, for they remind you of the hereafter. So let's see, what does visiting the grave do to you? You go to see a grave of a person, any person. And I want you to imagine this. If that person were to come out of his grave or her grave right now, what would they say to you? And it really hits you when you go and watch that grave, especially if it's a family member. It's difficult, but it gives you a slap on the face. What would that person say? In fact, imagine you are the one in that grave. And you had to look at your life in reverse. So right now, you are here. This is your life right now. I mean, Allahu A'lam. Tomorrow you and I may be dead. Allahu A'lam. Probably have another week. Maybe another month. Maybe another year. Maybe another 10 years. Allahu A'lam. Maybe another few hours. Allahu A'lam. None of us here can guarantee to leave this gathering and make it home alive. Isn't that correct? I'm not trying to scare you, but that's the reality. At any time. So how about this idea? Instead of thinking forwards in our life, let's try and sit down and think backwards in reverse. Imagine that you are now dead. What matters the most? Seriously, think about it. What will matter the most if right now you are dying or you're dead? Now let's think about all the things that matter to us really. Now I'm talking to you. I'm talking to myself first. And I want you to talk to yourself. Don't think about the person next to you. Don't think about your, 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 your friend or that other person who's doing this sin or that sin. Think about yourself really and be honest with yourself. Be honest with yourself. What really matters to you now? And then if you were dead, what would really matter to you then? So for example, if what matters to me now is how much money I've got or my business. If what matters to me now is my car, for example. If what matters to me now is my looks, for example. Or maybe my popularity. Then if I were to die tonight, would all of this matter to me anymore? 
Obviously not. What's your popularity going to do for you in your grave? Will you take your money with you to your grave? Will you take your family with you to the grave? Will you take your work with you to the grave? You know the word rizq, rizq, provision. The ulama told us something interesting about the word rizq. A lot of us think that what you have is your rizq. But that's not what rizq means. Rizq means what you have used. What you have used. So for example, uh, what's his name? Bill Gates. One of the yeah, richest men in the world. Let's say he has a house with 300 rooms in it. But all he uses is three or four rooms of that house. Then we say his risk is just the three or four rooms. All the others not his risk until he uses them. So if you have a lot of money, for example, your risk is what you've used. What you haven't used is not even yours. I mean, you might have it in the bank, you might have it invested, but it's not yours until you've used it. So when you are in that grave, what's the only thing that really matters? What would you wish to, tra to change about your life? And number one is your deeds. Your deeds. You would look back and think about that salat which you did yesterday. I did it too fast. Did I think about my salat properly? How fast did I read Al-Fatiha? How fast did I say Subhan Rabbi Al-Azim? Have I ever thought of changing my dhikr which I do in salat? I mean Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he used to say other dhikr, such as Subbuh al Quddus al Rabbul Malaikati wa Ruh. For example, he used to make long dua in ruku'ah, he used to make long dua in sujood. Now compare, how fast is our salat these days? What are we thinking about in our salat? My father told me this joke about a man who, uh, had, um, who went to salat in the masjid. And after the imam finished, uh, a group of people said, Ya Imam, Ya Imam, we prayed, we prayed Salat al Isha. He said, Yes, I know. Some of them said, well, we, we only did three rak'ahs. Another group said, No, it was four. So then they split. Everybody saying, a group saying three, another group saying four, Ya Imam, you did it wrong. But they saw this man sitting aside and they asked him, Why don't you say anything, man? Why are you sitting on the side there not saying anything? He looks at them with all coolness and calmness. He said, the Imam prayed right for rak'at. So they asked him, how are you so sure about yourself? He said, well, you see, I have four shops. And in the first rak'ah, I calculated my earnings for the first shop. In the second rak'ah, my earnings for the second shop. Third rak'ah, my earnings for the third shop. And the fourth rak'ah, my earnings for the fourth shop. He said, I don't have a fifth shop. So that means... We must have done the four rakas correctly. <laughs> Look what he's thinking about. Based the number of rakas of his salat on his worldly gains, not on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now I want you to compare that with a, with a man. I'm going to take you back to the time of the tabi'een now. There was a group of atba'a tabi'een. Stay with me. There was a group of atba'a tabi'een. Atba'a tabi'een means the generation after the generation of the Sahaba's children. So this was about maybe 60, sorry, it was the Tabi'een, about 60 years after the death of the Prophet ﷺ. And there was a group sitting there and they saw an old man praying. What did they see? An old man praying. Just praying in the masjid. His standing was very long. His ruku'ah was very long. His sujood was very long. So once one of the tabi'een, he said to his friends, I don't think this man can remember how many raka'at he's prayed. You know, he's saying so long, I don't think he'll even remember how many raka'at he's prayed. He'll forget. So then they said to him, well, instead of backbiting him, why don't you go up to him and give him advice? So the man's thinking about the number of raka'at. He goes up to the man after he finished and his tabi'ah he says, Ya akhi, you know, make your prayer a little bit shorter so you can remember the number of raka'at that you did so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can be pleased with you. 
So the man turns to him and says, If I can't remember how many raka'at, I know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He knows. So long as my intention is right, and I'm doing my best. Allah does not burden a person more than what they can bear. Worship Allah as much as you can. So then the young man, he, he saw that the old man had some wisdom in his words and he asked him who he is and guess who he ended up being? He ended up being the Sahabi Abu Dhar radiallahu anhu. The young man then turned around in shame, put his head to the ground and raced up to his mates. And he says, Allah yahdikum. You sent me to teach one of the Sahabas of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The point is, the other story I told you about, the man is thinking about his worldly gains and he remembered how many raka'at. This Sahabi is doing long raka'at. He can't remember how many raka'at, but his heart is fully attached to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Does it matter how many raka'at you've done? Or does it matter how your attachment to Allah during the raka'at is what matters? It is not about the quantity of your actions, but rather the quality of your actions. If you only had 100 dirhams and you donated 50 dirhams, but another wealthy person came along who has, you know, 10 million dirhams and he donated 1 million, which one is more worthy? Maybe both of them are equal. But the one that is more worthy is the one whose heart is more attached to Allah when they gave it. It could be that that 50 dirhams be more valuable to Allah than the 1 million. Why? Because when they gave it, they gave it out of their heart. There was no riya. They really loved Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they gave it really, really hoping for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's um, pleasure. Brothers and sisters in Islam, having said this, a person whose priority is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger will do the following. Any action that you do in life, any action, any action, you name it, your priority is to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in it. How? For example, you brush your teeth. You brush your teeth. Muslims and non-Muslims brush their teeth. Everybody brushes their teeth. Even the murderer brushes his teeth. The rapist may brush his teeth. The pedophile brushes his teeth. Right? Everybody brushes their teeth. Here is the difference. When you brush your teeth and you are thinking that this is one of the sunnas of the sunnas of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that when you pray to Allah, you would like your mouth to smell nice, and you want to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with it, then now brushing your teeth becomes a ibadah, a worship. Because your priority changed. When you bathe and have a shower, and you're having a shower with a different intention, that a Muslim should be clean, and that is part of the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to be clean, then suddenly a normal act which anyone does for you becomes an act of worship. When you eat, everybody eats. In fact, some people live to eat. And some people eat to live. Insha'Allah, we are the ones who eat to live. But when you eat and you enjoy your food, and you are thinking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala while eating, that Allah has provided you this food. You say, Bismillah in the name of Allah. You say, Alhamdulillah after finishing. Then now your act of eating becomes ibadah. Simply because your priorities inside changed. Even when you enter the toilet, something as simple as entering the toilet, and you choose to enter the toilet with your left foot. Wallah, you can teach it to your two-year-old. A child goes in with their left foot, doesn't talk when they're in the toilet. And when exiting, they say, Ghufrana, or Alhamdulillah, alladhi azhaba anil adha, Alhamdulillah to the one who has taken away the harm away from me. You remember Allah from a simple act which is considered to us to be an act of impurity. You are rewarded. It's an act of worship, subhanAllah. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to his companions also, don't let a day pass you except that you give an act of charity. And now an act of charity in Arabic, sadaqah, doesn't just mean giving from your wealth. 
It means any good act. Even if you bring a smile to your brother or sister's face, then it is an act of charity. Or relieving someone from any hardship or pain. Or saying a nice word that makes someone happy or relieved is an act of charity. Rasulullah said even helping a person lift their you know, belongings onto their into their vehicle, onto your camera, into your vehicle, into your car, or whatever it may be. And then he finally said this word. He said, even cohabitating and being intimate with your own spouse, with your wife, in your privacy, is an act of sadaqah, meaning an act of goodness. And then the Sahaba said, Ya Rasulullah, you know, doing something that we, you know, uh, we fulfill our desires in with our wife or our husband, we have rewards for it? He said, yes. What if you were to do this act in haram? Wouldn't it be a sin? They said, yes, Ya Rasulullah. He said, the fact that you chose the halal instead of the haram is an act of worship. Shuf, your priorities now. Some people this day and age don't even want to get married anymore. So what are they doing? They resort to haram relationships. What is their priority? Their priority is their nafs and their desires. But the fact that a person uses and goes towards marriage, even though marriage has its hardships, just so that they can resort to halal instead of haram. Allah, Allah who has made the halal pure for us and made the haram impure, just by doing that, your act is now a worship. So guess what? And I finish it with this. I recall a beautiful story about one of my friends, a colleague teacher of mine. We were picking up his child from the kindergarten. Do you have kindergarten here? You have kindergarten. Child care. As he was parking his car, parking his car, he hit the curb. The curb. And he said, Astaghfirullah. I looked at him and said, Yaqi, why are you saying Astaghfirullah just because you hit the curb? It's just the, you know, the legal system in this country. You know, by law, you shouldn't really hit the curb. You're saying Astaghfirullah when it's just the law? Say Astaghfirullah when you do a sin. He looked at me and said, Oh, no, 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 no. I didn't say Astaghfirullah because I hit the curb. He said, Then why did you say Astaghfirullah? He said, I said Astaghfirullah because I was startled. Startled. Startled means, you know, I got uh, shocked. He said, What do you mean? He said, Subhanallah, you know, when I was younger, Every time I got shocked or startled, I would say a swear word. A swear word. He said, then I thought to myself, when does being startled happen? It happens when something suddenly out of the ordinary happens to you. And then I thought, what if I'm crossing the road and then someone screams out, look out, a car is coming. I look and then it runs me over. And I die. I was startled. What would be my last words then? I said, if I get used to saying swear words every time I'm startled, then my life may end on something which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not pleased with me. And my last words will not be la ilaha illallah. So I got myself used to saying words of remembrance every time I am startled. Now it's automatic. Automatically it comes out. Just like the way people automatically swear or they curse. You know, when parents are very angry with their children, they break a cup or a glass, they swear at them. They curse them. Back in Lebanon, the Lebanese people, those who don't fear Allah, they got so used to saying swear words and curse words, right? Like mothers and fathers, that they got scared that if their dua, their curse word may reach their child. So for example... Um, Excuse me for saying this. Some fathers, uh, I've heard them say to their child, Allah yal'anak, subhanallah. May Allah curse you. So one day I said to one of these fathers, Ya akhi, stop making la'na on your child. Did you know that your dua may arrive at a time when your dua is accepted and because of your dua, your child becomes cursed? He said, La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. So a month down the track, I saw him, and then his son did something. You know what he said? He said, Allah ilan abuk. May Allah curse your father. 
I said, why did you say that? He said, so that the la'na doesn't go on my child. I love him too much. Let it be on me. La hawla wa la quwata illa billah. I said, ya akhi, instead of saying that, if you have to say the la'na, at least say, Allah yil'an shaytanak, masalam. May Allah curse your shaytan. Or at least even better yet, say, Allah yisamhak. Ghafar Allahu lak. Subhanallah. How beautiful is that? So that your last words before your death automatically come out of the dhikrullah. Did you know there's a part in your brain, a little part, that gets addicted by repetitive acts? There's a section in your brain that we learn in science. Men and women have it. Everybody has it. It's where you get addicted to things like drugs and very bad actions. Pornography, drugs, and other things. You can train that section in your brain by repeating actions all the time to get used to and addicted to something. We Muslims should only get addicted to good things and you can make yourself addicted to it. That's why in Islam we have dhikr words. Dhikr. In psychology they tell you if you want to be confident then every day say 100 times I'm confident, I'm confident, I'm confident, I'm confident, I'm confident. And these are non-Muslims who don't even know anything about Islam. They teach us dhikr and they don't even know that they're teaching us Islam. What did Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam teach us? He taught us to say, for example, Subhanallah this many times, Astaghfirullah this many times, La ilaha illallah this many times. Sometimes we get so used to it that we don't even know what we're saying. And we think we're just saying anything, right? No. Teach your children and get yourself used to repeating certain words. Because in your brain, there's that section which is constantly getting used to it, brothers and sisters. You get attached to it. You get addicted to it. So make yourselves addicted to the things which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves. So that your end, insha'Allah, will be on something which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased with, not on something which is displeased with. Make your priorities for Allah, not for materialistic, temporary things. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to assist us and help us in training ourselves to become addicted to the things which He is pleased with. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to cure our hearts and our souls. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to unite us on that which pleases Him. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to return us back to His religion in the way that pleases Him. I ask Allah to forgive our sins and to accept this worship from us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala listen to us. Ameen. Wa sallallahu ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in.